Well, welcome everyone um, to today's special Teos uh, seminar. Uh, so I'm going to do an introduction here. Um, uh, uh, part of what we're here today is to honor actually the, the late uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Robert Sess. Um, so, uh, so as many of you know, uh, we were saddened recently by his passing um, back on March 22nd of this past year. Uh, but his legacy lives on, and we've had this CES symposium for many years now. Um, and so his legacy lives not only here at Stony Brook, but throughout the atmospheric community. Um, so, uh, and needless to say, Bob uh, founded Atmospheric Sciences here at Stony Brook. Uh, he actually started in mechanical engineering uh, many years ago, and, and, um, and throughout the 1970s through the 90s, he wrote many influential papers, um, you know, with a specialization in radiated transfer uh, papers dealing with the greenhouse effect and related impacts and feedbacks, uh, and then some critical intermodel comparison studies uh, that were critical for the IPCC reports and so forth. So, so we miss Bob greatly. Um, but we're here today uh, with a, a distinguished atmospheric scientist, Ruby Lang, um, who's going to present the Robert Sess Symposium Lecture here today. So I'm very pleased to introduce her uh, here today. Uh, uh, she's a Battelle Fellow at the Pacific Northwest Laboratory. Um, she's also a Chief Scientist for the U.S. Department of Energy Exo Exascale Earth System Model, and she's also an Affiliate Scientist at NCAR. Uh, a little bit more background about Ruby. She received her PhD in atmospheric science at Texas A&M. Uh, she's an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and the Washington State uh, Academy of Sciences. She's a fellow of the AMS, the AGU, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and she uh, recently gave an AGU Jacob Bjorkney's lecture in 2020 and just received uh, uh, this year with AMS the Hydrologic Sciences Medal. So um, uh, Dr. Lang has received many, uh, uh, has done many contributions in atmospheric sciences in the analysis of climate using observations and models, uh, ranging anywhere from orographic precipitation, monsoon climate, extreme events, land surface properties, uh, and aerosol cloud interactions. And so today she's gonna to present some interesting climate work on mesoscale convective systems using observations and models. And I'm so pleased she can join us uh, from Paris, uh, France here today, virtually. So welcome, Ruby. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's really my great honor to be uh, delivering this uh, presentation at the SES uh, Symposium. Well, Bob Sess is a great inspiration to me and to, to many, many people, uh, many, many scientists in our field. Um, we are still doing these SES experiments, right? So we developed our <laughs> exascale Earth System Model E3SM. And, and the first thing we wanted to do is, okay, let's do the SES experiment to see to learn about um, uh, cloud feedback and climate sensitivity. And so again, this is really my great honor to be delivering uh, this uh, lecture and thank you for the invitation. I, I apologize for not being able to uh, really present in person, but I hope uh, that um, you will enjoy uh, the presentation just as well. So um, as Brian said, I'm going to talk about mesoscale convective systems in observations and a hierarchy of model. Uh, so before I start, I really want to, um, at, first of all, acknowledge um, my colleagues. Uh, I have many colleagues who have been working on uh, with me on many different aspects of MCSs or mesoscale connective systems. We look at models, we look at land atmosphere interactions, we look at uh, how uh, mesoscale convective systems might be changing under global warming. So, so these are the colleagues that I uh, put the, uh, the photos over here. And I also want to thank Department of Energy for the support, um, uh, mainly uh, a lot of the materials that I'm presenting today comes from a project called Water, uh, Water Cycle and Climate Extremes Modeling or WEXM uh, Scientific Focus Area. Uh, but I will also be presenting some materials uh, coming from the E3SM 
Energy Exascale Earth System Model Project, as well as another project called Exascale Computing Project. So with that, I'm going to dive into uh, talking about MCSs. Uh, but, but again, before I talk about MCSs, I want to kind of motivate why we are interested in MCSs. Is it all partly comes from our, our interest in really looking at uh, extreme events. Um, this is a, a very interesting report coming from UN that was published in 2020. Uh, here they compare the last uh, 40 years, looking at the first 20 year compared to the uh, uh, near term, the, the closest 20 years. And they are listing over here these uh, disaster events by types, comparing the earlier 20 years with the more recent 20 years. And many of these disaster events are really related to climate or weather, right? So if you look at drought, you know, extreme temperature, flood, um, storms, uh, particularly over here and wildfires. So you see a significant increase. These are global numbers. Uh, you see really large increases in many different types of weather events, such as floods and also storms, uh, as well as wildfires. And as a result, uh, there has been increase in the reported uh, disasters, uh, the total number of death and people affected as well as economic losses. So, uh, Back in 2017, uh, the Bulletin of American Meteorological Society made a statement. They said that we are experiencing new weather because we have made a new climate. So this really inspired us to, to look at these new weather and new climate. And I would like to say that a, a, one way of connecting the new weather with the new climate is really through humidity. And that's what I wanted to emphasize. It, this is a paper we recently published uh, just in March. Um, and here we look at how humidity is playing a role in connecting weather with climate. So we know that uh, humidity or the water vapor uh, increases with temperature. And this is essentially following a nonlinear rate called the clausius clapeyron relation. Right? So, but water va vapor itself is a greenhouse gas. So because of um, the increase in water vapor with temperature, and water vapor itself being a greenhouse gas, the humidity essentially can amplify the warming by a factor of about 1.5 to two. So this is already a very important contribution by adding to the warming. But at the same time, as humidity increases with warming, the latent heat release will also increase. And, and the latent heat increase can, um, can drive tropical convection and also change atmospheric circulation. At the same time, the increase in the latent energy can play a very important role in extreme weather. And this is what I'm going to show before I go into a massive scale convective systems. So oftentimes when we talk about global warming, uh, we look at surface air temperature, right? So with this is what we call SAT, surface air temperature. We talk about how uh, global warming may be uh, in the future, the, the, the global mean surface air temperature may be increasing by about four degree or three degree, et cetera. But we'd like to here emphasize that besides looking at surface air temperature, it's also very important to look at another quantity, which we really like to advocate for. This is a quantity called surface equivalent potential temperature. So this is what we call theta Y at the surface. We argue that this uh, theta Y at the surface is a very important integrated metric of temperature and humidity. And therefore, it can provide a more comprehensive metric of global warming than simply looking at surface air temperature alone. For example, if you look at theta Y, so this is defined as uh, the temperature plus uh, this quantity over here, which depends on the um, specific humidity Q, right? So let's take a look at over the tropical ocean. Um, in the tropical ocean, the temperature is roughly about 300 degree Kelvin. And so this L divided by CP times Q is roughly 50K. So, which means that latent, en latent energy can contribute to the total amount of energy, which is defined by uh, theta E, uh, contribute about 17% to the thermal energy. Uh, 
So it sounds like 17% is not that much, but more importantly, let's take a look at the change, right? It, it is the change that matters. For example, uh, we know that uh, under global warming, generally the relative humidity stays roughly the same. It doesn't change very much. So as a result, uh, this specific humidity can increase at roughly about 6% per degree of warming because of the clausius clapeyron relationship. And therefore at 300 degree uh, K, uh, this increased by about 6% per degree. And then if you put this number over here, we can see that for each one degree of warming over here, this quantity itself is three degree Kelvin, which means that the total change in theta year is one plus three. So one degree of warming in the, in the near surface air temperature is equivalent to a four degree increase in the theta E or surface equivalent potential temperature. So this is a really huge number over the tropical area. So what I'm going to show you now is that this quantity uh, theta E equivalent potential temperature correlates much better with convection and with extreme uh, events such as extreme precipitation. For example, we look at uh, ELA5 uh, reanalysis and we calculate the correlation uh, between surface air temperature with convective available potential energy. If you do this, you notice that over land, in fact, you mostly find negative correlation because essentially the warmer the temperature, actually the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the larger the cape, although the cape can actually induce convection and as a result, it actually cools off the surface temperature and you can actually, you actually see a negative correlation between the two. On the other hand, if you calculate the correlation between uh, the equivalent potential temperature with cape, you see mostly positive correlation, suggesting that this quantity is a much better quantity to use if we are interested in looking at convection and how convection may be changing under global warming. At the same time, we also look at for uh, extreme precipitation, such as like looking at annual maximum precipitation uh, in the tropical area. So here we take a look at uh, the surface air temperature and against uh, these uh, annual maximum precipitation. You see that the correlation is not very high. In fact, we get a correlation coefficient of only 0.33. And at very high temperature, in fact, you get even like a negative relationship between surface air temperature with annual maximum precipitation. However, if you calculate the same thing, but instead use theta E, equivalent potential temperature. Instead, you see a very strong co linear correlation between the two at a correlation coefficient of 0.98, suggesting that indeed the, uh, this equivalent potential temperature is a much better indicator of extreme precipitation. And we, you can calculate this for many other quantities related to extreme weather and you'll find a much better correlation uh, between the extreme weather metrics with the surface equivalent potential temperature than with uh, the surface air temperature. So let's take a look at uh, how the equivalent potential temperature has changed in the past. So here we look at the last uh, 40 years, looking at reanalysis data. Uh, we can see that if you look at the surface air temperature trend, uh, there is a polar amplification, and then there's also a pretty big land sea contrast in terms of the warming uh, uh, based on the surface air temperature. However, if you look at the change in the theta E, you do not see a polar amplification because over the tropical area where there's a lot of moisture, uh, in fact, the theta E can increase a lot. So if you look at theta E instead of surface air temperature, this is a much more uniform change and a much higher value as well because of the latent energy contributing to the in increase in the total amount of energy. So looking at climate model projection into the future, so here we are looking at the change in the global surface air temperature, uh, SAT, which is uh, shown by the red line, uh, towards the end of the century, um, based on this uh, uh, LCP 8.5 scenario, uh, we, can, uh, we can see that uh, glo global average surface air temperature increased uh, by about four degrees uh, Celsius, or so four degree Kelvin. 
But if we look at uh, theta E instead of surface air temperature, this is an increase of 12 degrees. So this is a really significant number. And what does it mean? So in this paper, we estimated that a 12 degree increase in the equivalent potential temperature contributes to 14 to 30 fold increase in the frequency of heat extremes a 40% increase in the energy available for tropical deep convection, and also up to 60% increase in extreme precipitation. So you will notice that uh, comparing equivalent potential temperature with surface air temperature, this quantity increased much faster and at a nonlinear rate because of the clausius clapeyron relationship compared to the increase in the surface air temperature, which is typically almost like quasi-linear. Suggesting that if we are really to look at what warming target we should be setting in order to reduce uh, the reduce changes in the extreme weather, we really should be looking at this equivalent potential temperature, and the and where we would be setting the target might be the place where this quantity before it begins to rise rapidly or non-linearly because of the clausius clapeyron relationship. So I would really argue that it makes a lot more sense for us to be looking at the equivalent potential temperature and set the warming target by looking at the area before it sharply increases due to the nonlinear relationship. And so this has potentially a lot of uh, policy implication in setting the global warming target. So with that, um, I'd like to take a look at like projecting into the future, like the change in the theta E. Uh, again, we see this uh, tropical amplification because this is the area where we would expect a lot of increase in the water vapor. So you would uh, see that uh, uh, spatially uh, in, the, in the future, you would see both a polar amplification as well as a tropical amplification. But generally, there is not a big lengthy uh, warming contrast. Um, if we look at a model projection of extreme precipitation, you also see a, mostly an increase in extreme precipitation almost everywhere. Um, however, if you look at just mean precipitation rather than like extreme precipitation, uh, climate models really have uh, large uncertainty in terms of like where we would be expecting the mean precipitation to increase or to decrease. And this is particularly true um, over North America, especially um, in the summertime over the central United States. And this has really caught our attention to think about why there is such large uncertainty in model projection of whether precipitation will increase or decrease in the future over the central United States um, uh, during summertime. So this uh, led us to really look into uh, mesoscale convective systems because we know that uh, over the central United States, a lot of the precipitation during springtime as well as summertime, generally the warm season, precipitation is mostly produced by uh, mesoscale convective systems. In fact, we, know, we noticed that about 30 to 70% of the warm season rainfall comes from MCSs. And so this study by Stephenson and Schumacher also show that um, over the central and eastern United States, most of the um, extreme precipitation in the during summertime is produced by MCSs, whereas in the fall season, uh, some of that might be related to tropical cyclones. And then in the spring season, some of that might be related to synoptic systems. Right? So it, it really motivated us to look at MCSs or mesoscale convective systems. So, but to make sure that we are all on the same page in our understanding of what a mesoscale convective system is. So an MCS is what we call a contiguous cumulonimbus cloud complex. It's really big with a horizontal dimension of about a hundred to like thousands of kilometer, and it can last for up to 10 to 24 hours. So this is a very typical depiction of a cross section of an MCSs where you would find a deep convective core, but also at the upper level, you see a very large uh, NFO clouds um, and, and producing a lot of um, convective precipitation, heavy ring rate, at the convective core, but also a lot of stratiform precipitation because of the large info area. So this is in contrast to the typical kind of cumulus clouds that we normally think about in terms of, con <clears throat> in terms of connections, where these 
uh, typical cumulus clouds they, <clears throat> that I mentioned is much smaller. They're only about 10 kilometers compared to like hundreds to thousands of kilometers. And they generally also large much uh, shorter, only like a few hours instead of like 10 to 24 hours. Um, so here we are asking three science uh, questions related to MCSs. The first one, how well are MCSs simulated using different modeling approaches? And I'm going to introduce several uh, different modeling approaches that we have tried and evaluated how well they can simulate MCSs. And then we also look at what limits or contribute to the predictability of MCSs during summertime? And the reason why I highlighted summertime is that we find that summertime is really difficult for model to be able to produce MCSs. And therefore that kept us asking like, why MCSs are so difficult for models to handle during summertime and what contribute to the predictability. And then lastly, we also asked how MCSs might respond to global warming and therefore contribute to changes in the mean and extreme precipitation, such as over the central United States, where there are lots of MCSs during spring and summer. So now I'm starting with the first question, how well are MCSs simulated using different modeling approaches? Um, in order to uh, determine how well models can simulate MCSs, we need to have a way of identifying MCSs in the observation and also in the model simulations, right? So the first thing we did was to develop MCS tracking algorithm so that we can track MCSs in observation and, 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 and also in simulations. Here I'm showing uh, two different ways to uh, track MCSs. The first way is over the United States where we have uh, three types of data, right? So we have satellite, cloud top, uh, infrared radiation. This is important because as I mentioned before, MCSs has a signature of very large and full cloud. So if you look down from satellite, you can see a very cool cloud, uh, <coughs> a very large cold cloud shield. And so this is one piece of information that we use in order to track MCSs. But over the United States, we also have a really good network of mixed red radar refractivity. So that allow us to really detect convection that is going on. And then we also have stage four precipitation. So with these uh, four, uh, four kilometer resolution and hourly resolution data set, we can track MCSs and we produce an, an MCS database over the US between 2004 and 2017 uh, at hourly and four kilometer resolution. But then globally, uh, we do not have uh, mixed red or radar data everywhere. So in order to track MCSs globally, uh, we use uh, essentially only two pieces of information. The first one is still the cloud top infrared radiation or the brightness temperature coming from satellite data. And the set, second piece of information is coming from global precipitation data, such as the GPM IMERGE uh, precipitation data set, which is available between 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north. And the data is at hourly interval and 10 kilometer resolution. So we track the cold cloud shield as well as the precipitation beneath the cold cloud shield that is produced by the MCSs. So based on, uh, based on the size of the cold cloud shield, as well as the size of the precipitation feature and how long these features last, then we uh, track MCSs for a 20 year period from uh, year 2000 and 2019 at hourly and 10 kilometer resolution. So with this kind of uh, tracking uh, technique, uh, we are able to produce a global MCS data set. And this data set is really useful because it allows us to look at many different aspects of MCSs. For example, we can estimate how many MCSs happen during a particular season or, or annually. And so this is what we show on the upper left. Uh, we, you can see uh, over the tropical area, there are some regions where MCS frequency is particularly high for example, over the maritime continent, over uh, the Amazon, as well as over the Congo uh, basin. Uh, but we can also look at like the MCS lifetime, how long do MCSs last? And we see that over the tropical ocean, this is where MCS lasts the longest and they can last sometimes like between 36 to even like 40 hours. Uh, whereas in the mid latitude, they last a, a little bit shorter between 20 to 24 hours. We can, we can also estimate uh, the fraction of MCS precipitation contributing to the total precipitation. And here, what you see is that 
uh, several regions, uh, MCS really contribute to a very large fraction up to like 60 to 70 percent of the precipitation comes from MCSs. And this is in this area, Argentina. So this is why there was the fuel campaign, the cacti and the Ramalago fuel campaign uh, that happened just uh, two, three years ago where they did a lot of measurements of MCSs. Uh, but MCS also produced a lot of precipitation in, in the Congo Basin as well as in, in the Sahel region. With the data set, we can also calculate the MCS translation speed because typically they kind of propagate. Uh, uh, um, in the direction of the pre prevailing winds. Uh, so with that, then we can track MCSs in observation and model simulation. So here I show you an example where we track MCS in simulation produced by the DOE Earth System model called E3SM. Uh, we try two different techniques to uh, track MCSs. The first one is how about we track MCSs only based on the infrared radiation? Because actually a lot of MCS tracking method, they don't look at precipitation, they only look at the, the cold cloud shield produced by the MCSs. And we did that. And we find that based on this kind of tracking alone, we see many areas where we see this kind of bluish color in terms of the contours. It shows that based on this type of tracking, uh, uh, the E3SM models produce too many MCSs compared to observation because mostly we get positive, the bluish color is the positive uh, biases. But if we track MCSs based on both the outgoing long wave radiation as well as the precipitation, then we find that mostly uh, the model underproduce uh, the number of MCSs, suggesting that the, the U3SM model is able to produce a really big cold cloud shield, like the big envelopes, but it's not able to produce the heavy precipitation that is typically associated with MCSs. And then we also composite all the precipitation produce, produced by the MCSs over the central United States. So these are examples of the composite of precipitation. And here we compare four different models that participated in the high risk MIP simulation. This is part of the CMIP-6 experiment where the model, climate models were used to run at higher resolution between 25 kilometer to about 50 kilometer. So using three different metrics, the correlation, the root mean square error, as well as the model bias, we see that models have different skill in, in how well they simulate the, the MCSs. Uh, uh, particularly, for example, looking at E3SM, uh, we find that uh, it, it has a negative bias, uh, uh, particularly related to precipitation. But another model, like the NICARE model, produced way too much precipitation compared to other models. Uh, so, so, so this is a very useful way to look at how well MCSs might be uh, simulated by the, by the model. But generally, what you see is that the root mean square error comparing springtime versus the summertime, the summertime root mean square error is almost always larger than the springtime root mean square error in all of the models. Yes. So um, why is it so difficult for a model to be able to simulate MCSs, right? So I, I, I like to really suggest that it is the um, storm structure that matters a lot, right? So typically um, when, um, when scientists develop um, cumulus parameterizations for use in global, cl uh, global climate models or for use in weather uh, forecasting model, we typically have to make an assumption that within the climate model itself, you get a population of cumulus uh, convections uh, such as shown over here. But in reality for an MCSs, they don't look like a population of cumulus uh, convection at all. They organize in a way such that they have big anvil area, they have very strong convective precipitation and, and also stratiform precipitation. And as a result, they usually carry with it a very heavy, top heavy kind of heating profile. So it's really matter in terms of what structure that we see in terms of the convection that affect the large scale circulation and also affect the precipitation. And, and therefore, I would say that MCSs are more difficult to simulate by the climate models compared to the typical cumulus uh, convection because of the differences in terms of their storm structure. So 
and and therefore we have to find other ways to to really better simulate um, MCSs. So here I look at three different types of techniques. The first one is a regional model. So regional model allow us to go to very high resolution, such as convection permitting type of simulation of a, of a few kilometer. But now we also have uh, models, atmospheric models, where we can get down to very high resolution using regional refinement. And here I'm going to show you some results based on this model for prediction across scale MPAS. And then I'm also going to show you some results coming from the use of super parameterization or multi scale modeling framework. So this is applying a super parameterization within the DOE Earth System model E3SM. So let's start with looking at uh, limited area models, such as the Wolf model. Here we run the Wolf simulation at four kilometer grid spacing, and we ran it for like the whole warm season for about four to five months. And then we, uh, we look at the probability distribution of the MCS lifetime. Uh, the MCS event mean precipitation, as well as the size, the, the diameter of the MCSs. Here, the blue color is based on observation, tracking MCSs in the observation, and then the red is based on tracking MCSs from the wolf simulation. So we see that by go going down to four kilometer resolution, the model generally does a pretty good job in capturing the really wide range of uh, MCS lifetime precipitation, as well as uh, the size of the MCSs. Um, when we look at uh, using another technique, such as these global variable resolution model, where we have regional refinement getting down to four kilometer over the central United States, here we particularly look at the model simulation for two different periods. One is in spring, April time, and the other one is in August, summertime. So these are Hofmuller di diagram showing the MCS precipitation based on observation and then four different simulation where we use regional refinement to get down to 25, 12 and four kilometer resolution. And we see that during springtime, even the 12 and the 25 kilometer simulation is not too bad in terms of capturing these uh, prop eastward propagating MCS precipitation. But in summertime, uh, 12 kilometer and 25 kilometer essentially do not give any MCSs. Uh, four kilometer, we can see some MCS precipitation produced, but it's much lower than the observation. Again, highlighting that summertime is very difficult for the models to do. So we see the same thing even in the E3SM simulation. So here again, we are comparing over the central United States. This is a global simulation, although we zoom into looking at just over the central United States. So the left-hand column is, uh, is um, observation for the springtime in the upper panel and then summertime in the lower panel. And then the middle one, the middle columns are E3SM simulations at roughly quarter degree and then embedding a cloud resolving model within each of the GCM grid cell. And the cloud resolving model is at four kilometer resolution. So, so here we use the same uh, cloud resolving model embedded within E3SM. And then on the right hand column, these are uh, also E3SM simulation at roughly a quarter degree, but without the super parameterization. So what you can see is that with super parameterization, the model does a pretty good job in reproducing the MCS precipitation quite comparable to the observation. Whereas without the super parameterization, the model even at quarter degree resolution is doing a very poor job. But when, but when you look at the summertime, even if we include a super parameterization at a quarter degree resolution, the model is still way under producing MCS precipitation compared to observation, although it is better than the simulation without the super parameterization. Again, really highlighting the challenge of simulating MCSs during summertime. So um, we also look at a global simulation as well. So recently we developed um, a version of our E3SM model that we can get down to global cloud resolving simulation at about three kilometer resolution. Uh, we have a non-hydrostatic dynamical core that can run without the physics. This non-hydrostatic dynamical core is a C++ version that can run on a, a, a close to like an exascale computer uh, at 1.4 simulation year per day. And so I'm going to show, showing you a set of simulation 
where we um, ran this uh, diamond two simulation for 40 days globally at three kilometer resolution. So what I'm showing you here, these white blobs are uh, mesoscale conductive systems that we tracked. Uh, upper panel is based on our E3SM simulation at roughly three kilometer resolution. And then in the bottom is observation based on uh, satellite uh, as data. So you can see that at this resolution, this is uh, January, uh, so the Northern uh, winter. Uh, but the, uh, over the tropical area, the model is able to produce a lot of MCSs quite similar to observation. So now the second question that we are addressing um, is particularly related to the challenges that we are seeing in uh, simulating MCSs during summertime. Okay, so um, I have a hypothesis that um, perhaps the reason why summertime is so difficult to simulate is partly because of this positive feedback loop. For example, if you look at an MCS, uh, the rainfall of an MCS shown over here. So the MCS has a very large info area, as I mentioned before, and therefore producing quite a lot of stratiform precipitation. As a result, you see a really top heavy uh, heating profile um, related to the MCSs. And because of this top heavy heating profile, you essentially, it will create a potential vorticity or a mesoscale vortex. And so this mesoscale vortex provide a lifting mechanism, a positive feedback that can moisten the atmosphere, which then can further feedback to produce stronger MCS and producing more precipitation and therefore top heavy heating profile. So with this hypothesis, Potentially then if your model is not able to simulate, let's say the, this kind of uh, MCSs, even if it is a weak MCS to begin with, you won't be able to get the top heating profile. You won't be getting the mesoscale vortex and therefore you won't be getting this positive feedback. So to test whether this hypothesis is indeed the case, uh, we perform two simulations using the Wolf model. We just change the the cloud microphysics scheme, because we know that the cloud microphysics scheme makes a big difference in terms of the amount of precipitation produced by the MCS. So here using two different schemes, one is called the Morrison scheme and the other one is called the Thompson scheme. We see that using the Thompson scheme produce more precipitation and a more top heavy heating profile. And therefore with a stronger vertical gradient of the heating profile, we expect to see a stronger potential vorticity. And indeed, this is what we found comparing the two simulation. The one driven uh, using the Thomson scheme produced a very strong mesoscale vortex or the PV associated with the more top heavy heating profile compared to the other simulation. And as a result, we also see that this simulation with the Thomson microphysics scheme produce MCSs that are longer lasting, so kind of su supporting our hypothesis that uh, you need to really be able to produce this top heating heavy, top heavy heating profile in order to simulate strong and longer lasting uh, MCSs. Another potential reason for why summertime MCSs might be very difficult to simulate is because MCSs form under different environment during springtime versus summertime. This is a very typical example of the type of um, system that MCSs are embedded within during springtime, which is typically kind of like a synoptic system with a, with, with, a vort, with a vortex or something like that. Whereas during summertime, oftentimes MCSs develop under a high pressure system and they form in the peripheral of the high pressure system. So suggesting that the environment themselves might be one reason why MCSs during summertime is very difficult to simulate. So let's take a look at um, some analysis that we perform using self-organizing map. So using these self-organizing map, we identify, uh, first of all, we identify all the MCSs in the observation data set, and then we use reanalysis to composite and then uh, using self-organizing map to identify what are the typical kind of large scale environments that MCSs developed uh, during summertime. And we find that there are typically four types of environments where MCS develop during summertime. 
this type of environment is quite typical and, and it's easy to understand why MCS would form under this type of environment. So here you see a very large uh, cyclo um, uh, cyclonic circulation in the upper atmosphere. And therefore you would have uh, vorticity advection towards the central United States and also inducing vertical motion. So this is the type of favorable large scale environment that we would expect MCS to be able to develop. But we find that besides this type of environment, MCSs often also form under environment that are very unfavorable. In fact, in this kind of environment where you see a cyclonic circulation uh, to the east of the central United States, so this would actually induce downward motion, right? So, so this would actually not be a favorable type of environment for MCSs. But why MCS still form under this kind of environment? When we perform a uh, convection center type of composite to look at the environment, we see that even though the upper level field is unfavorable for the formation of MCSs, at the lower level near the surface, oftentimes you see an, some kind of anomalous moisture. So this is um, what, what I'm showing here, the red color here is the surface equivalent potential temperature. So suggesting that some excess moisture near the surface, it could be coming from low level jet, it might be also coming from increased soil moisture, and they can also provide a favorable near surface environment that might be helping the MCSs to form. So further looking into the environment, we find that, um, uh, again, looking at convection center composite, here, I'm showing you um, uh, the center of the uh, MCSs. And then we are looking at 36 hours before an MCS is initiated all the way to 36 hours after an MCS is initiated. And we find a very typical kind of feature in all four types of environment, yeastward propagating feature shown in all four types. And, and it's very interesting that after an MCS is initiated, so the colors over here show the um, PV, the potential vorticity. So essentially what you see is that there, there's already some kind of uh, PV, prop, yeastward propagating PV that help to provide the environment for MCS to form. And then after an MCS is initiated, you actually see another propagating PV, which is the PV generated by the MCS itself. And, and this MCS generator PV does not propagate at the same speed at the large scale PV prop, uh, that, that provide the environment for the MCSs. So overall, we find that eastward propagating environment is really important for summertime MCS formation. They might be coming from some mid tropospheric perturbation originating maybe from the Rocky Mountain, such as the like lee side vorticity generation. It could also be related to residual short wave trough. It could also be related to gravity wave initiated by the mountain. But in any case, summertime MCSs seem to be always associated with this type of eastward propagating environment. And they can exist very far up stream even as far upstream as like from the Pacific coast propagating towards uh, the central United States. So now um, because we identify that the surface anomaly of the moisture equivalent potential temperature is important for the development of the MCSs, we also wonder whether maybe such anomalous moisture near the surface could also be provided by soil moisture anomaly. So here we uh, look particularly at the role of land surface processes in MCS precipitation. Well, we developed a technique called a uh, numerical tracer. So essentially we implemented a numerical tracer in a land surface model. And so when we provide the precipitation to the land surface model, we tag the precipitation uh, to determine whether the precipitation is associated with MCS or not associated with MCS. Remember we have MCS tracking method that allow us to tell at every location and every hour, whether the rainfall is MCS related or non MCS related. So once we numerically tag the rainfall, then we can track the rainfall through the soil column simulated by the land surface model. We can determine how much of the 
rainfall comes back through evaporation and how much goes into surface runoff. So this allows us to really look at the impacts of MCS and non-MCS rainfall on the land surface processes and the feedback through the evaporation to the atmosphere. So what we found is that uh, because MCS rainfall generally is much heavier in terms of intensity, therefore, in terms of the soil moisture profile, they create a deeper soil moisture profile, whereas non-MCS rainfall, they are lighter rainfall, not very light, but lighter than MCS rainfall. They tend to be more um, kind of residing near the surface. And as a result, these would produce more evaporation uh, to the, uh, at the surface. But the MCS produced rainfall because of the deeper percolation, it can last longer, provide a longer lasting source of moisture that uh, evaporate to the surface. So with that, um, we noticed, um, we did quite a bit of um, uh, analysis looking at land atmosphere coupling strength associated with MCS rainfall and non-MCS rainfall. And we find that um, the MCS rainfall is the key mechanism for providing the evapotranspiration that induce convection and subsequent precipitation. So this is a paper that we published last year. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into the detail of, of the analysis that we did, but I can summarize very briefly what we found in terms of how MCS rainfall is important in providing the moisture for subsequent precipitation. There are essentially two mechanisms that we identify. The first one is related to the size and the amount of MCS rainfall. As I mentioned before, MCSs are very big, much bigger than the typical non-MCS kind of um, convective precipitation. And therefore they usually can uh, induce a very big footprint of uh, soil moisture anomaly at the surface. So these large contiguous um, kind of like coherent pattern of wet dry, wet dry kind of pattern can essentially induce a vertical motion and therefore convergence and produce like convection. And, and so what you can see is that if previously you have an MCS that produced this kind of um, anomalies of the soil moisture pattern, it can subsequently induce convergence near the surface and therefore contribute to precipitation, convective precipitation at a later time. At the same time, as I mentioned also, that MCS rainfall is very intense and therefore it percolates much deeper in the soil layer and therefore it can provide a constant source of moisture evaporating at the surface even during nighttime and therefore it is an Im Im important contribution to the de subsequent development of MCSs and therefore essentially this in this paper we identify that MCSs dominate the soil moisture precipitation feedback which is a positive feedback in this case and this is a negative feedback in this case for the summertime rainfall in the central United States. So lastly, um, I hope I still have some time to go over my last question, which is about how MCSs may respond to global warming. So several years ago, we uh, looked at, uh, after we developed an MCS database over the United States for about 35 years long, then we started doing analysis whether to see whether we might be able to see a trend in the MCS precipitation. And what we see that indeed over the last 35 years over the central United States, we are already seeing an increase in the uh, 95th percentile exceedance frequency associated with MCS precipitation, meaning that MCS precipitation, the extreme ones is getting even more extreme. And then at the same time, when we look at the lifetime of MCSs, we also see that uh, over the last 35 years, the lifetime of MCSs has increased. And so to understand roughly why the, that might be the case, we perform analysis of uh, reanalysis data. And we see that um, over the last 35 years, there has already been warming. And so these uh, colors over here show the warming signal. And of course, the warming is larger over land compared to the ocean. And as a result, it induced um, anomalous sea level pressure. So these anomalous sea level pressure essentially induce a southerly flow, kind of enhance the, the Great Plains low level jet 
transporting more moisture towards the central United States. So potentially this might be one mechanism for why we have been seeing an increase in MCS precipitation as well as the MCS lifetime. So, um, but to further look into, uh, okay, so let me go back to here. So when we, uh, so, so for this analysis, we were particularly only looking at the springtime where the trend in the MCS precipitation and the changes in the last scale circulations were more obvious. But then looking at the summertime is a bit uh, unclear whether MCS has changed or not. And this also motivated us to further look into the summertime. And, and as I mentioned before, it's very difficult for, climate model to be able to simulate summertime MCSs. So in order to create, to develop a hierarchy of models to help us look into this problem, we recently uh, developed a simple Lagrangian parcel model. So this is essentially based on uh, the simple framework of Roms and Quang. Uh, um, essentially what, you, what, what we simulate is that um, this parcel, uh, buoyancy driven parcel, uh, you can provide a, a, a kind of like a, a warm bubble or you can give it a little bit dynamical lift. And, and if the environment is unstable, then the, 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 the bubble will essentially rise and the, the parcel will rise and that it will produce precipitation, et cetera. So, so here are the equations that we put into this model and I'm not going to go through this. Uh, so, but with this uh, Lagrangian parcel model, we try to see uh, what contribute to uh, more um, and, and enhanced convection. So uh, we play with, for example, the boundary layer moistening anomaly. So we give the parcel a little bit of anomaly in the moisture. We also uh, give it a little bit of dynamical lifting. So both of that can help to induce vertical motion and therefore set off convection. And so the model correctly simulate that the more the moisture you give it or the larger the dynamical lifting, the, the, there would be a stronger convection. And so this is just to, to show that the model is working. Um, here we also see that um, this is coming from observation of uh, precipitation, uh, pre uh, precipitation. Um, and we, we look at um, how, whether using a simple parcel model like this, that we'd be able to simulate uh, the precipitation observed over the United States, as well as can we reproduce what climate model sets about how precipitation may be changing under global warming. So here, uh, this is uh, the summertime precipitation based on ELA5. And this is based on applying our Lagrangian parcel model at every uh, grid point driven by the environmental profile coming from ELA5. And using even a very simple model such as this parcel model, we are already able to simulate roughly a, a, a pretty reasonable pattern of precipitation compared to observation. And here I'm showing you the uh, CMA5 model projection of how precipitation during summertime may change in the future. So the CMA5 model shows that over the central United States, precipitation will decrease. And then over the Eastern United States, precipitation will increase. So using the, temp uh, using the environmental profile simulated by CMA5, applying that to the parcel model at every grid point, we are actually able to reproduce almost the same uh, kind of pattern compared to the CMA model, suggesting that this uh, parcel model is pretty useful in terms of really getting a first order estimate of uh, precipitation as, as well as how precipitation may change given how the envi environments or the environmental profile may be changing in the future. But just a puzzle model itself is simply looking at convection, cumulus convection. They are not the same as mesoscale convective systems as I mentioned before, right? So here we actually extended the um, uh, this, the simple single column Lagrangian parcel model into a multi-column Lagrangian parcel model where we simply connect all these single column parcel model together. But by connecting them together, we introduce several mechanisms that we think would be important in order to simulate MCSs. These are three different mechanisms. The first one is if in a particular column, there is convection going on. So this convection will create a cold pool and then the cold pool will, um, will create collision. And this collision can induce uh, 
uh, vertical motion or convection in another location. At the same time, uh, this uh, convection column can produce a gas front and the gas front can spread out. So when the gas front spread out, it can also induce a weak upward motion can, can, that can help with the convection. And then overall, there's also a weak subsidence because if you have convection going on, it must be balanced by the overall subsidence. So these are the only three mechanisms that we put into the model when we connect the individual single column parcel model together. So let's see what the models simulate for us. So interestingly, uh, this is a Hofmuller diagram starting from time zero. So here we simulated almost like a thousand uh, columns uh, of this single uh, si simple parcel model because they are really cheap to simulate, right? So starting from time zero, we randomly perturb and then create connection. So initially, everything is really random. Some, some grid cells, you have connection, some grid cells, you don't have connection. But after simulating for roughly about 12 hours, you begin to see convective aggregation, even in a simple Lagrangian puzzle model like this, by, by including cold pool dynamics, gas front spreading and subsidence, we are able to actually reproduce a big organized convective cell like almost like um, a mesoscale connective systems, or we can call it uh, connective self aggregation. So this is a comparable to um, uh, applying a 2D cloud resolving model uh, using similar condition. This model also simulate this convective aggregation, but here is simulated by this uh, single column uh, or multiple column uh, Lagrangian parcel model. So to, to determine which mechanism is most important to induce this kind of uh, convective self aggregation, uh, we perform three other simulation where we turn off one of the mechanism that we talk about. For example, here, we turn off the co-pool collision mechanism. Here, we turn off the gas front spreading, and here we turn off the subsidence. We find that these are the two most important ones. So without cold pool collision or without subsidence, you essentially would not get convective aggregation, whereas gas front is important, but it's not like completely uh, necessary. So with this um, uh, multi-column simple Lagrangian puzzle model, we are now beginning to perform simulations driven by environmental profiles coming from GCM to determine how uh, MCSs might be changing under global warming. So I hope to be able to present results related to that in the future. So with that, uh, I would like to summarize uh, what I've talked about. Um, so I've been really highlighting the importance of MCS and they are ubiquitous. Uh, they have many impacts on weather, climate, and regional and global energy and water cycle. You know, MC, uh, we develop MCS tracking method so that we can produce uh, data sets based on observation, and we can also track MCS in model simulations. So with that, we were able to evaluate how well models simulate MCSs. And we find that generally, when we get down to a few kilometer resolution, M, um, models are quite well in terms of simulating MCS, but still mostly only during springtime, not so much in terms of summertime, even when we get down to a few kilometer resolution. And we find several reasons for that. Number one is that MCS during springtime tends to be supported by synoptic forcing. So if the model can produce the synoptic forcing, it seems like it would not be that difficult to simulate MCSs. And then in the summertime, we find that MCSs are associated with smaller scale eastward propagating atmospheric perturbation. And they seem to be very challenging for the models to even capture that kind of mesoscale eastward propagating perturbation. And then I also highlighted potentially a positive feedback loop uh, between the MCS, the heating, top heavy heating profile and the mesoscale vortex or the PV that could be making MCS very difficult for model to do. And then I also highlighted the important role of MCS in terms of the soil moisture precipitation feedback. And then I hope that in the future, I could present to you results coming from this multi-column multi Lagrangian parcel model. Uh, but of course, we can also use um, um, regional convection permitting type of model to, to, to look at that as well. So with that, um, thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't run over for too long and I, um, I would be glad to see if there are any questions for me. 
Great. Thank you, Ruby, for a very interesting uh, seminar uh, today. So uh, I'm going to invite everyone to chime in with a question by raising your hand. And we'll go from there. So they're jumping up. I think Mingwa beat Edmund by about a tenth of a second. So Mingwa, <laughs> do you want to? Yes, hi, Ruby. Very, very interesting. Lots of information to digest. Uh, uh, regarding summer versus spring, uh, do you think the land atmosphere feedback is stronger in the summer than spring? Will that matter? Yeah, I definitely would think that uh, the uh, the land atmosphere feedback would be more important during summertime because again, that's partly related to the fact that during springtime, there's still quite a lot of synoptic system, right? So if if the convection is associated with synoptic system, then it essentially diminish the role of land atmosphere feedback. So so I I would agree that summertime would be the season where land atmosphere interactions would be very important. And in fact, I think uh, last year. There, were, there, there, is a paper, there was a paper published by, by the NCAR group where they implemented some changes to the land surface model to be able to better represent subsurface processes. And then they find that they were able to improve the simulation of the summertime MCSs over the central United States quite a bit. So, so indeed, I mean, based on our analysis of um, these kind of soil moisture, you know, using the miracle tracers to track MCS and the and the evaporation and things like that, along with the NCAR study, I think both studies suggest that um, the soil moisture anomaly play a pretty important role. Thank you. Okay, uh, Edmund. Hi, Ruby. Uh, Hi. Great. Great talk. So yeah, I, I have a question again about the summer case because uh, your, your results suggest that even down to 4 km, uh, the model still do, did a very poor job. So you part of the reason was because of the land uh, atmosphere uh, interaction. So, uh, but you also mentioned that maybe those, uh, because you, uh, the, the precursors might be more difficult to catch. Yeah, but yeah. based on your, your uh, analysis, uh, they seem to be still not too small a scale. Uh, the mm. scale is still see hundreds of kilometers uh, rather than sort of just a very small wave, uh, mm -hmm. gravity wave that, it's, that, that models will not actually see. And so what's your thought about why models are, uh, are having difficulties? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so yeah, so, so let, let me get back about this um, kind of yeastward propagating uh, perturbations, right? So mm -hmm. I've, I've shown, so when we do the analysis, we essentially identify, uh, group the environment into four major types. So in the first type, that's the type where the environment itself very strong, uh, and favorable, and 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 also the scale is pretty large. So when even when I when I show the yeast web propagating system, the the scale is much larger. But remember that there are also these other types, right? So if you look at type three and type four, if you remember, so those uh, are also yeast web propagating environment, but their spatial scale is quite a bit smaller than compared to like uh, type one and type two. So so I think those are the ones that are the most difficult for the models to be able to do. Right. So, so the models, it's not like they completely do not simulate MCS. They do simulate some, but not as much as in the observation. And, and my belief is that it is the type three and type four environment where the yeast were propagating features are actually mesoscale rather than my like synoptic scale. So those are the ones I think models not able to do, but, but we have not been totally able to um, really identify well, what are these yeast wood propagating environments? <laughs> so we, we would like to continue to do our, our analysis, especially some of these uh, propagating features start pretty far upstream, suggesting that there must be some potential predictability if we can really understand what created those yeast wood propagating environment, right? So, so, so that's what we would uh, need to continue to look into. But I, I just want to make sure we, we get the point that 
Even for the yeastwood propagating environment, there are some that are larger scale, but then there are also some that are much smaller scale. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, hi, me. Yeah, uh, hi, Ruby. Thank you very hi. much for a very nice talk. Uh, I'm, I'm especially interested in the biases in MCS in mm -hmm. uh, E3SM. So how much, so how does the biases in uh, simulating MCS impacts the other modes of variability? I'm particularly <laughs> interested in how the improvement of MCS simulation impacts the MJO uh, in this uh, Indo-Pacific maritime continent area. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I know E3M, E3SM has very good MJO simulation. So, um, can you yeah. comment on that? Yeah, yeah very, very good question. Yeah, so um, w first of all, when we um, look at the E3SM simulations, it seems like the major problem that we have, um, we, we are able to simulate large feature. In fact, uh, some of these feature may be even too large, uh, these cold cloud shield envelopes, mm -hmm. but the model is not able to produce intense enough precipitation and therefore they are not qualified to be called MCSs. So the precipitation is the part that has been the problem, at least in the E3SM model. But then your question about like, okay, so if the model is not able to do this, I mean, would it be affecting the variability simulated by the model? I would think so, even though, even though as you said, E3SM does indeed have a reasonable MGO, um, but I, I, I would imagine that if we are able to do a, an even better job with the MCSs, I would think that we can even improve upon how we are doing now with the, with the MJO. So we have started some analysis now, uh, essentially identifying uh, based on observation data. Uh, uh, so Sui Chen's group has developed these um, MJO masks. Tricky. Yeah, they are MCO tracking. So, so based on the MGO tracking and the and the MCS tracking, we are now beginning to composite them together to look at whether within the MGO mass, whether MCSs are propagating eastward or westward or, or things like that. So we hope to be able to <laughs> tell you a, a, a bit more later in uh, as in terms of like the the role of MCSs in MGO. I, I believe that it, they play a very strong role. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that if the model is not able to simulate MCSs, I think it must have some impacts on the variability. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ruby, I had a question or so. Um, uh, I was intrigued by your, um, your uh, I think toward the end, the parcel uh, results that seem mm -hmm. to suggest that the cold pool dynamics or so forth was kind of secondary or not as important as the other factors. And and it didn't come up much in your other part of the, your, uh, your seminar too about cold pulls and models and being able to you know, properly represent them for MCSs. So, mm -hmm. so I, was, I was curious about that uh, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you know, much of there's a lot of MCS theory, RKW theory and so forth based on cold pool dynamics. So. Oh yeah, okay. Well, let me make sure. Um, yeah. So, I might have confused you with the result. Actually, uh, it, on my last slide, when I showed the uh, numerical experiment where we turn off one of the mechanism one at a time, in fact, we do see that cold pool is the most important mechanism. So cold pool as well as the weak subsidence are most important. Is is the is the gust front spreading that is not as important. Yeah, cold pool is okay. indeed very yes. important. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sorry, I, I misread that yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, but how does that relate to your like your high resolution modeling, which has under prediction in the summer? And so I guess kind of expanding on what uh, what you were saying with others. Um, yeah, the weather community uh, has been struggling for years with land surface properties to yeah. represent you know short term forecast, uh, uh, and that so we know that's an issue. Um, mm -hmm. um, but then you have all these other issues, uh, you know, that that could play a role. Whether it's a bias in the in the shear profile, uh, the elevated mixed layers that may come off the Rockies mm -hmm, uh, that provide mm -hmm. the boundary layer over the plains, um, and and uh, uh, and and yeah, these short these disturbances that you're referring to uh, are, intrigue me because uh, you know I interpret them as like very short wave, you know upper level PV anomalies in some sense that are very mm -hmm. difficult to represent. So yeah. 
So the question, yeah, how do you sort all this multi-dimensional problem out? Uh, <laughs> you know, where where you're where it, it, yeah, where it could be other things too. Yeah, good question. As I as I said, I mean, so far based on just by doing like self-organizing map and uh, compositing the environment, that alone can only carry us so far, right? So based on that, we we now know that. All, most of the MCSs in the summertime, they develop under this kind of eastward propagating environment. But we still haven't been able to really tease out like are these like gravity waves? I, I suspect them, it must be a mix. Some of them might be gravity wave related. Some of them might be like this mid tropospheric perturbation related. And some of that might be something else. Like for example, those that propagate so far upstream, what could they be? <laughs> we, we haven't really fully figured that out yet. I, I hope if any of you interested in, in working on this problem, I'd be really interested in collaborating and try, trying to, to, to better understand that. I mean, especially with folks uh, who know about the synoptics environment and the dynamics. I mean, I, I, I like to really get a better sense of that. I mean, we, we have only been able to tell that they are related to different types of Eastward propagating environment. Some are larger scale, some are pretty small scale. Okay. And Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, hi, Ruby, great talk. Um, I just kind of, Brian mentioned shear and I, I was thinking about that as well when you were talking about your results uh, mm -hmm. related to the past 30 or 35 years and, and more precipitation and longer lived systems. And that, that would say to me that, you know, there's a lot of talk in, in the, in the climate change community about mm -hmm. what happens um, to vertical wind shear mm -hmm. uh, over you know, long periods of time in, in a global warming scenario. You know, we understand that there'd be more instability, uh, but shear is kind of a, a tough one to get a handle on. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, when you have, it seems like longer lived systems and more extreme precipitation, that would say to me that at least um, the shear that's necessary to, to get long-lived MCSs, which you know, would be maybe not as extreme as you would need for supercells or tornadoes or, or, or other types of convection, mm -hmm. um, isn't, isn't really an issue. Um, and that, that you know, the, the increase in, in instability um, is not, um, uh, obviously is there, but the, you know, there's this thought that there's gonna be less vertical wind shear and that doesn't seem to maybe be happening uh, over okay. the, the past 30 or 35 years. Can you comment at all on, on mm -hmm. trends in, in shear as they relate to MCSs and, and long-lived extreme precipitation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so generally, I think we, we, we think that wind shear is important. Uh, I think especially if you're talking about MCSs over the tropics, shear is definitely very important. But over the mid-latitude, such as over the central United States, it is less obvious to me whether wind shear is indeed that important. At least, at least based on our self-organizing map analysis, we were really thinking that the self-organizing map will pick up wind shear as, the, as one of the most important factor, but that's not what we see. In, in fact, the self-organizing map doesn't pick that up at all. So, um, so wh whether this is um, potential, uh, potentially a limitation of the methodology, or is it really that the, in the central United States, the wind shear is really not playing such an important role? Because we are talking about MCSs, not necessarily like, tornadoes or, or the really severe uh, type of events, right? So, right, so I think exactly, this is yeah. also something that we, we need to look into, but at least based on just MCSs, not the really severe type of um, convective systems, we are not seeing uh, wind shear as important, at least based on our analysis. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, hi, Ruby. Um, hi. In, in some of your earlier slides, you, uh, you showed um, uh, as a function of time and in, in some model projections, the increase of surface temperature and the increase of uh, theta E. Mm -hmm. And you showed uh, theta E increasing more rapidly because of the curvature of clausius clapeyron mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether you're advocating that that groups like the, the uh, Conference of Parties or, or the, the led to the Paris Accords use um, theta E as a criterion uh, rather than um, 
uh, surface temperature. And uh, just to, to, predict, to, to maybe guess at your answer, um, I would think if you plotted theta E against surface temperature, you'd get a, a pretty good, it wouldn't be linear, but a pretty good relation between the two. So it wouldn't matter too much, but I'd like to hear your view. Um, yeah, indeed, I would advocate that we should look at using theta E as a metric more, right? Not maybe not exclusively, but I think it, it provides really important information for the fact that we find that theta E has a much stronger relationship with extreme weather. Like, I, I, for example, I show the correlation between theta E and Cape is negative over land. And then I also show uh, the relationship between uh, surface air temperature versus um, uh, the annual extreme, uh, annual maximum precipitation is not, is not a good relationship at all for surface temperature, but for theta E is a really, really good correlation of 0.98. So, so theta E is a much better description of extreme events. And, it, and if our go, part of our goal, of course, um, with global warming is to limit the impacts of global warming on society. And that kind of impacts come mostly from extreme events. So in that case, I think using theta E as a global warming level that we should try to limit makes a lot of sense. For another reason is that because this relationship is much more nonlinear, right? So if the surface air, the surface air temperature increase almost linearly, then why, why would you say, oh, we should limit uh, surface air temperature to two, de two degree or three degree or one degree. What's the reason? Why, why one, why two, why three? But if you have a highly nonlinear relationship, you should limit it before it starts going ex ex exponential, right? So I, I think for, for these two reasons, number one, theta E correlates much better with extreme weather. Number two, that it has a nonlinear relationship and therefore you should try to cut it off before it goes like this. <laughs> so I, I think for these two reasons, I would really advocate that we, we, look, we need to consider theta E much more um, appropriately um, in terms of thinking about uh, limiting global warming yeah, to uh, what level. Yes. Has there been any response to that advocacy? Say again. <laughs> okay, you, you say you would advocate uh, the theta e, and I'm wondering whether uh, there's been any response to your advocating that. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> advocating meaning that we wrote the paper and we and I gave presentation, but I haven't <laughs> actually talked to. I mean, I, I'm not part of the. I, I I mean, this is already past the IPCC, right? So. <laughs> so Sounds like you're throwing it over the transom and seeing if anybody uh, responds. Okay, thanks for your response. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Ruby, for a very interesting seminar, and uh, and thank you all for coming here today.